Welcome uh, to the Australian National University uh, this evening. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet tonight, pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. Uh, it's great to see so many of you around. We have many distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends of uh, tonight's inaugural address by uh, the Vice Chancellor's entrepreneurial professor, Mark Kendall. Uh, and we're very delighted that so many were able to come, and some from quite a considerable distance. I'm also particularly pleased uh, that we have ACT Health Minister Megan uh, Fitzharris back, so welcome. Um, uh, Mark has brought uh, family, Faith and Luca Kendall here, so welcome down wherever I've seen you enter, but there we go. Uh, and uh, I do hope that uh, your whole family's had good fun. Uh, you've been over at one of my favorite places, Questacon, uh, and uh, you uh, have done something I've never done, which is the free fall ex uh, uh, exhibit, which uh, I find too scary to do. Uh, I have acrophobia, it's terrible. So one of the things uh, at ANU is, as Australia's national university, we have a responsibility, an obligation, to be a global uh, resource of policy and ideas that help to improve lives and make the world, we hope, a better place. Uh, and to do this, there's many things we can do, but one thing we've been working on is to break down the barriers between A and U and those who can use our research to achieve these aims, whether they are in business and government or in the not-for-profit sector. So one of the ways we've been trying to do this is our entrepreneurial schemes. Uh, and the scheme is facilitating, driving, and developing interdisciplinary research areas across the university to identify new approaches to significant research and innovation challenges. And we hope to drive a cultural change in academia. Uh, for too long, those who have done this, and there have been a few, and a few here I see tonight, have perhaps not received uh, the plaudits that they should from the university, the support they should have, and yet they managed to uh, soldier on, and we're trying to make that a regular part of the university. The first appointment under the scheme was Professor Genevieve Bell, one of the world's foremost technologists and public intellectuals, and I'm very proud to introduce to you tonight Professor, Professor Mark Kendall, the second appointment under this scheme. Now, Australia's medical research community is world class. Professor Kendall's work is at the cutting edge of new wearable medical devices. Professor Kendall is a genuine rocket scientist. His PhD is in hypervelocity aerodynamics. Uh, and at the University of Oxford, he was an inventor of biolistics technology. Uh, that is ballistics in the biology sphere. And the inventions he contributed were commercialized with Powder Med, which was purchased by Pfizer for $400 million in 2006. Uh, Professor Kendall came back to Queensland under Peter Beatty government's Smart State Initiative, which was uh, designed to develop the state's knowledge economy. And in Queensland, he invented the Nano Patch, which was commercialized in 2011 through the company he founded, Vaxis. And the NanoPatch is a next generation vaccine delivery platform and it is able to deliver vaccines in a hundredth of the normal dose without the need for refrigeration. You can imagine that is uh, a very significant development for developing countries where consistent refrigeration from point of production through storage and delivery to communities is often a fundamental barrier to the safe and effective supply of vaccines. Now I personally met Mark uh, when he was at UQ uh, through our interactions at the World Economic Forum uh, and his work there as the, on the Global Future Council for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. As I recall, we were thinking about existential risk for humanity and basically, you know, the 10 best ways that humanity will do itself in over the last, uh, over, over the coming hundred years. A really, uh, uh, uplifting uh, conversation in Davos, I can tell you, but we had all the right people in the audience talking about humanity's doom and gloom. Uh, his genuine desire to improve the lives of people across the globe through medical innovation was inspiring, and uh, I was talking to him back then about, uh, I didn't know I was going to be vice chancellor then, so I was just talking to him at that point, and then about a year and a half later, we talked about how we might try to do things a little differently, and I was pretty open to anything that we might thought might work. 
uh, and was able to eventually encourage him to join us here at ANU as part of what is an experiment. Now, the technology Professor Kendall works on will have, we hope, far-reaching implications for our health and well-being into the future. Uh, he's working on a simple wearable devices that will provide a form of personalized medicine. These micro wearables uh, could provide personalized diagnostics across a whole suite of diseases. And these will be minimally invasive, pain-free health monitoring, which you can imagine uh, could really change the way we administer health. Professor Kendall's company, Wear Optimo, is working on devices that range from low-cost disposable devices for shirt duration uh, measurements through integration to the next generation smartwatches for continuous monitoring and precision health. And uh, like any good company, it's got a great uh, new logo, uh, which I take to be Australia turned on, or at least the potential of turning Australia on, which is all what this company is about from my perspective. But just imagine a world where blood tests and other patho um, pathology are no longer routine because your micro wearable is doing it all the time and is able to put the information to your GP or your uh, health professional. So it sounds a bit like uh, science fiction, but this really is a potential new reality. And so it is now an honor for me to welcome Professor Mark Kendall to the stage. Mark? Uh, so, so thank you for the, the warm introduction. Uh, it's, a, it's a real honor uh, to be here uh, today. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to thank uh, people that come from uh, long distances as well as short distances uh, to be here. Now, um, we, we've got a few things I'd like to try and cover off today. As Brian said, it, it is an experiment uh, that, that we're running. And uh, the title of uh, my presentation talks about a uh, future to do with uh, the fourth industrial revolution and healthcare, and this idea, this, this experiment of, of Wear Optimo uh, that, we're, that we're launching uh, effectively uh, tonight. Now, first a little bit about who I am. Uh, so I'm a, a biomedical engineer and I love producing medical devices of substance that uh, can make a difference uh, in, in humanity. Uh, Brian's kind by saying uh, I'm a rocket scientist. Uh, let's just say I'm a non-practicing uh, one. It's been a long time since I've been doing that. Uh, but today I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we got here. So there's three things. How we got here, what we're doing now, and what we're looking to do uh, in, in the future. So it's a very simple uh, structure. Now, first up, um, you never know what you need to know. And uh, I had no idea I'd end up in medicine at all. In fact, I was going to go in a completely different uh, direction uh, was to continue work on rockets. And, uh, but a two minute conversation changed everything uh, for me. And it was, uh, I met a, a, an Englishman, and I won't try and mimic his, his accent, uh, but um, he said, I really enjoyed your presentation. I was at a conference with him, and I've got this idea to uh, use rockets to fire vaccines into the skin. Would you like to come and work with me? This was more than 20 years ago now, just at the end of my PhD. And I thought, that sounds interesting. Uh, Okay, um, where is it? And he said, it's Oxford University. And I said, would I get a chance to row? And he said, he said if you're good enough. Uh, so three months later, uh, we were there, uh, uh, my wife Faith and, and me. And it was an amazing uh, experience uh, for us. Uh, so there's all the things you'd expect about a place like Oxford. Uh, the cold, uh, the uh, old teaching rooms and uh, all of those sorts of things. The academic excellence, uh, that was clearly there. But one of the, the big surprises uh, for me was uh, learning, it, it turned out to be an eight year apprenticeship uh, in innovation. So it turns out working with this, this thing, uh, Brian mentioned science fiction uh, before, well this is very much inspired, I'm happy to pass this around, very much inspired by Star Trek. So you know the device that, psh, well this is a, kind of physical embodiment of something like that, but there's a bit more of a kick uh, to it. It's a supersonic uh, device that fired uh, particles into the skin at 1,500 miles an hour. Gold microparticles, small ones, uh, so that uh, there's, they're pain-free. Uh, so I'm happy to pass that around. It's not a loaded gun, uh, but you can, you can take, take a look at it. And what did we learn from this? Well, so many different things. Learned how to patent ideas 
how to work in interdisciplinary teams, how to keep true to the science as well, because in the end, that's, that's one of the most important things. How to commercialise, how to work uh, with, with companies as, as well. And so that, for me, was uh, very important uh, in shaping uh, who I am today, and that was quite, quite some time ago. Now, looking ahead, there was, um, Brian mentioned uh, Peter Beattie, so in the early 2000s, uh, the Smart State, Smart State Initiative was, was pushing ahead in leaps and bounds. And uh, I was convinced to, to leave Oxford and, and go to the University of Queensland, one of the new research institutes there called the AIBM. And I had an idea in my, my back pocket called, called the Nanopatch. And it was a, an amazing uh, adventure uh, to, to take that forward, to take turn that idea into something uh, real and, and do it within the Australian context. So uh, explaining the, the nanopatch briefly, unlike the, the gene gun, which is uh, over there, it's, that's another name for it, the biolistics Brian rightly identified as the combination of bi biology and uh, ballistics. Uh, I, I should back up by talking about the problem uh, we're trying to solve. So Bill Gates uh, put out a call for vac better vaccines for the developing world. And I sat down in my office there in Oxford trying to make it work, make the gene gum work, and it, and it wouldn't. It was too complicated, too expensive, and a bunch of other uh, problems. A little aside, uh, by the way, um, biology. So you think rocket science is hard, and it, and it is. <laughs> biology is harder, um, for, at least for me, uh, because the biological variability is, is humbling. Uh, you, just, you think you've nailed something, and then pff, something comes, and you have no idea of, no explanation for it. It's biological uh, variability. And t within this particular narrative, uh, the, yes, the rocket was hard and my job was to start with the rocket, but uh, it turned out that the real challenges were in the skin, the biology of the skin, the immunology of the skin. And uh, I had to start getting a handle of that and, and learning it, and that was not, uh, not, not easy. So it turned out the gene gun wouldn't work for the developing world, so uh, that was a problem. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? So I sat down and thought, OK, well, here's what we now know about the skin, map the skin's immune system with uh, uh, some great immunologists over there at Oxford, and designed a device from the ground up uh, to try and place vaccine to the cells in the skin that tend to matter uh, for, for improved vaccines. It's called an patch. And unlike the, the big device that um, I just, just passed around, this is an example of um, uh, an patch, And you can immediately see it's a lot smaller. But also unlike the device I pass around, which is uh, taking something from aerospace and putting it into biology, uh, in some ways this was uh, taking something from Silicon Valley and putting it into biology. So this is a silicon chip. So I needed to find ways to make this work and uh, a silicon chip uh, turned out to be the case. So again, happy to, to pass uh, the nanopatch around. What we see, there you are. Uh, what, what we see here is an example of a nanopatch compared to a needle. And in this particular case, it's a device for the mouse. There's 4,000 projections uh, on that uh, particular device. And you apply the patch to the skin, you dry coat vaccines to it, and the vaccine is released and released quickly and targets those uh, key uh, immune cells. And this is a, a close-up of what it looks like uh, when uh, one of these types of devices is applied to the skin. And it looks like a cartoon, it's a, it's a pretty image, uh, but it's not, it's real data, it's a scanning electron micrograph. Uh, this speaks for itself, this is one of the projections uh, from one of our devices, the layer in red at the top is dead skin, it's a stratum corneum, the brown is the viable epidermis, and the purple is the dermis. So we've not shown the, the cells uh, of interest in this particular image. If I try to sum up in one image, I suppose, uh, 20 years of, of work, this, this wouldn't be too far off off the mark, uh, it's interfacing with the skin in functional ways uh, as opposed to just producing a, a, a medical widget and then trying to find a use for it. Uh, we study the interface, the physiology of the skin and, devi and design fit for purpose devices uh, in order to, to meet that particular need. And if you're wondering what drives me, uh, this is a, a good image uh, for that. Uh, so this is a, uh, taken a little while ago now, it's when we went to Papua New Guinea uh, for a usability study uh, with the nanopatch. And it's the, the global health narrative. Uh, it's getting uh, these devices out in, into the field. In this particular case, we're at Port Moresby with the practitioners. Uh, they're getting these, these uh, nanopatches, well in this particular case it was mock-ups of them, uh, but in, in the hands of the practitioners and learning about uh, what happens in the field and feeding them back 
into our devices to make them uh, work better. So perhaps being infected uh, by, by my days in Oxford in 2010, 2011, uh, the data uh, looks strong and compelling uh, using uh, CSL's uh, influenza vaccine called Fluvax, trivalent at that time, now, now quadrivalent. And uh, so we we're faced with a fork in the road. Well, do we continue on the academic line or do we actually take the, take the leap and try to turn this into something real uh, as in the form of a company? So we did the latter. I founded a company called Vaxis and uh, ran an interesting experiment uh, for about four years. And so the experiment was uh, to be a full-time professor at the University of Queensland and effectively a full-time executive in Vaxis. Uh, so let's just say it stretched my Protestant work ethic uh, a, a little bit and um, learned a lot uh, in that period of time. And so Vaxis is uh, still going forward and it's in the clinic and um, taking things forward on that front. But I stepped out from that, which brings us on to uh, here where we are uh, today. So that's a little bit of a background uh, in a few slides, trying to compress 20 years of my life uh, from a technical uh, point of view, uh, at least. Then I noticed uh, something. I did a sabbatical at, at Harvard uh, in 2015, around the, around the time uh, I saw Brian, started working with the World Economic Forum. And then it's, it's interesting, you develop an instinct for something and uh, you think, okay, there's something here and, and you can't even fight it, it just sort of pulls you in. And so uh, a little, little survey, uh, I suppose. Uh, so first, uh, is anyone wearing a Fitbit device? If you don't want to admit it, that's okay. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a few. And uh, so, yeah, Faith, thank you for wearing a Fitbit. And, and she'll hate me for, that, for saying that. Um, and anyone wearing an Apple Watch? Okay, where's Luca? Luca should be wearing an Apple Watch. I'm not just doing this on purpose with them. Uh, so that's probably what we think about when we think about wearable devices. Uh, another little survey, since I'm at it, uh, is who thinks I know a lot about the fourth industrial revolution? <laughs> okay, there's a few people just, just re nudging. Um, okay, so I, I want to just take a little moment uh, to cover off uh, these, these two things and talk about the context of Wear Optimo and uh, what why we're we doing what we're doing, why are we running this, this particular uh, experiment. So how about we start with, let's, let's start with the fourth industrial revolution, okay? Uh, so to describe the fourth, we've got to talk about the first three, okay? Uh, so most of us, when we think about the industrial revolution, we're talking about the, the first one, and that's very much characterized by mechanical things. So steam engines is one great example uh, of that. <coughs> Primarily at its zenith, it was in uh, the 1800s, and it took a long time for it to roll out around the world, and it didn't really achieve its full, full reach. Massive changes, though, that came with the, with the first Industrial Revolution, including, it could be argued, the founding of Australia from a European perspective, but we'll save that for another day. Second Industrial Revolution, primarily electrical, okay? Uh, and the champions for that were not uh, people like uh, Brunel in the UK, but there was a lot of the champions for that were um, in the US. And so we're talking about uh, people like Edison, uh, we're talking about the telephone, the telegraph, uh, but also manufacturing. Uh, as we think of manufacturing, that was really developed in the second industrial revolution. So you could argue that the, fab the uh, fabrication of Ford motor cars with Henry Ford, second industrial revolution. Now the third, uh, looking around the room, it's very much in our lifetime. So it's a, it's a digital uh, computer uh, revolution. Okay, and we can look around and see great examples uh, of that. Of course, most of us would have one of these or some, something like that. That's a great embodiment. I, should, I was meant to turn this off. Sue had asked me to do that. <laughs> uh, so, but anyway, don't call me. Um, so that, that's one example of uh, what took place in, and, and is taking place in the third industrial revolution, the internet. Uh, computers, transistor radios, and it's happening very quickly, faster than the other two. And who are the champions of that? Companies like Google, uh, companies like Apple, uh, and, and so on. And they've really created a, a revolution. I mean, here's, here's just one example. If someone said to me, uh, I'll be here in 2018 talking about a company that's only 20 years old, yeah, with an R&D budget that is bigger than all of Australia's, I wouldn't believe you. But that's Google, okay? And that's 
a, a snapshot of some of the things that are, that are taking place. But that's the third industrial revolution. So what's the fourth? Uh, so working with uh, the World Economic Forum, uh, learnt a little bit about this because it's a, a key topic of the forum. Now the fourth is a whole bunch of different fields taking off at the same time. So the, the third is very much digital, and the fourth will include that embodiment, uh, the Internet of Things. It's estimated that uh, something like a trillion devices will be connected uh, to the Internet uh, within a few years. That's just one example. To me, that seems obvious, okay? But there's, there's other ones. There's all these other fields taking off at the same time. We have artificial intelligence. We have um, genomics. We have other forms of biotechnology, nanotechnology. They're all taking off at the same time. And the question is, what's going to happen when all of those things, how, those, how do those things come together? And how do we handle that? How do we train uh, people to get their head around uh, that kind of thing? Is it possible that uh, the, the ability to make things uh, can actually outstrip our imagination now? Because it's usually been, been the reverse. So that's an interesting idea. Uh, now, let's bring it into healthcare now. So the fourth industrial revolution in, in healthcare, of course, Another way of talking about this is great examples of personalised medicine and, and digital health. Now, um, I'd now like to come in to talk about the wearables thing because I've talked about fit, the Fitbit and, and the Apple Watch. That's really what we think about uh, when we think about a wearable uh, device. And there's great reasons for that. But they're not really functional medical devices yet. Yet, that is. But right in front of our eyes we can see uh, that um, there's a march up the value chain where soon uh, wearable devices brought in, a, in a wide, in a kind of widespread way uh, will be functional uh, medical devices. And this field is like nothing I've ever seen before. Uh, so let me explain uh, what I mean by that. So the first is, uh, so the gene gun, if someone can hold up wherever that is, uh, it's over here, and the nano patch, wherever that is in the room, harder to see, it's up the back. Okay, they're, they're both examples of, of an industry that's been around for a very long time. Uh, it's the pharmaceutical industry. It's a mature industry, okay? And I, I try to fight this, and I've tried it in many different ways, but it seems to always come back to this. But uh, when you succeed in this industry, it takes 15 years to go from idea to product. It's a 15-year ride. Uh, so Ian Fraser's uh, narrative, uh, which includes CSL and includes Merck and, and others, uh, from my idea to product, it was about 15 years. And we can debate the reasons why, uh, but a lot of it is just the, the nature of the industry, the, the nature of the regulatory uh, hurdles and, and so on. But that's what it is. But what's happening in this, this wearable space is, yeah, it's, it's like nothing I've ever seen before. Its epicenter is not the, the, this, this pharm the, the traditional pharmaceutical industry. It's coming out of uh, places like Silicon Valley. It's coming out of places like Google. And unlike the pharma industry, where it kind of comes from this uh, methodical uh, lockstep uh, approach, uh, the culture is very, very different. Uh, it, it's the culture of people that uh, can produce billion-dollar companies from their backyard or their garage, don't have the, the background of working with regulatory authorities. And so there's a culture clash uh, that, that's coming. But also on top of that, they're extremely well capitalised as well. So the, the likely, uh, one of the likely epicentres of this is, is Silicon Valley. So why are we here in Australia and why, why are we talking about it and what's where Optimo got to do with any, any of this? So uh, yeah, Brian, Brian and I have been talking uh, for a little while and um, Brian came on as, as Vice Chancellor and he wants to get some big things done uh, in innovation and, and try to change the way we do things uh, as well. We don't need necessarily always uh, more of the same. Now, in the context of, of what we're talking about here, I could, I'll talk about micro wearables in a moment, but um, that's the, the core idea and uh, the ability to gain access to the skin for all manner of signals. So I could try to do it the way that I've done it before, uh, working uh, within the, the classic pharma uh, context where it will take 15 years, write some research grants, uh, hopefully win a few uh, with the ARC or, and or the NHMRC, and after X amount of years, uh, have some feasibility data, and then try to set up a, a company and, and take it forward. And if you succeed, that might be a 15-year ride. 
Now, of course, other than the fact that I'll be an extremely old man by the time that gets done, uh, so I'm not, not a big fan of that, it, but it actually wouldn't work in this space because in the meantime, uh, unlike this field which is moving at the speed of sound, uh, this other field is moving at the speed of light. So, what do we do about it? Well, one option is uh, I could sit back and watch it unfold, uh, kind of like a, a spectator in the grandstands eating the popcorn and write about it. We've tried to do it the, the way I've done it before, but uh, I'm, I'm convinced it wouldn't work. Or uh, we could set up a fit-for-purpose enterprise uh, that's well capitalised, a biotechnology skunk works, and I'll talk about what that means in, in, in a moment, where we're focused, we have the, the backing of, of ANU, we work really closely within it, but we're not tied under all of the, the, the layers that you can tend to sometimes happen uh, in an academic context. And just as a little aside, one of the outcomes from, from the World Economic Forum is they're arguing that the universities are going the wrong way. And I know that might not be a PC audience, uh, a thing for me to talk about in this audience today, but uh, what they're saying is that we're getting caught up in our metrics so much that it's forcing us to do incremental uh, research and, and it, we end up get caught in, getting caught in a, a machine where it's the papers leading to a grant leading to the papers. What we're about is trying to really change the way things get done and produce impact. So that's why we've came up with this, uh, this framework uh, for, for Optimo. It's a company. The idea is for it to be very well capitalised. The idea is for it to be entirely focused uh, a, a top team of really bright people, not required to write papers, of course to do it when, when, uh, when we choose to, but focus on global healthcare impact. So that's, that's the core, core vision. Now, let's talk about what we're actually doing. So this is a kind of little snapshot of where we are today, and it's, uh, it's the look forward. And this is a, an example of uh, one of our micro-wearable uh, embodiments and another one as well. So this is a single-use disposable uh, type device and this is something uh, longer term. So what big problems are we going to try and tackle or, or be focused on? And how are we going to make this worthwhile? So here's one example. Now there is a bit of a backstory to this uh, and I'll share it with you. Uh, we did think about doing this as a live experiment uh, here today and the only thing holding us back was uh, the Wi-Fi here might be a little bit uh, shaky otherwise we, we would have given it a Given it a go. But, uh, so this is, this is something I, I, I had tested um, just a day or two uh, ago. So what are we looking at here? Uh, so firstly, this is one example of uh, a micro wearables. It's gaining access to the skin very, very shallowly for a fit for, a fit for purpose uh, signal. And in this particular case, I'm about to play a, a movie in a moment. Uh, but this particular case, it's a, a simple electronic uh, measurement called ECG. Uh, which is to give you a readout of uh, how your heart uh, is, is performing. And it's a field that's been around for a while, but it's still a field that you can get wrong uh, in many different ways. Now, what most other techs have is this kind of stuff. It's called noise. While this is a, a kind of clean signal uh, that you can generate with one of our types of uh, micro wearables that are applied to the skin. Uh, so that's just one simple example. And it's a stepping stone application. It's not the one that excites me the most. Now, the one that, well, there's a few that excite me, but one uh, that really grabs my attention is, what if we can generate signals like that, uh, that are continuous, that pick up and detect uh, a heart attack as it's about to happen, okay? Now, to do that, you need to gain access to all manner of biomarkers, in particular one uh, called troponin. And we think we have an approach uh, with our micro wearables uh, to do that. Why? Why do this? Well, it's the biggest killer on the planet. Uh, so uh, it's not infectious disease. There's 14 million uh, deaths per year due to infectious disease. That is a big problem, there's no doubt. Uh, but today's, one of today's biggest problems is uh, cardiovascular disease, and it is the biggest killer. And even in this year, in 2018, people can drop dead uh, from a heart attack uh, with no warning. And this is an interesting going full circle uh, now as well. It's going back to my mechanical engineering uh, roots. Uh, because have a look at cars today. Uh, so cars, uh, a high level car, I'm, I was told today by uh, someone within the industry, might have about 2,000 sensors within it, okay? Uh, a standard car may have about 200 sensors within it, but it's, it's detecting things all the time and you get to find out how your car's working. Can any of you guess how many uh, signals that are produced by sensors on, on the human body? 
for, for medical, regular medical use? Pretty much none, uh, actually, when you think about it. We have to wait until something goes wrong, then go to the hospital setting, and then get wired up. And it's an event, it's an acute event at that point. And when we look at some of the lifestyle diseases, uh, I don't want to sound uh, negative here, but uh, quite a lot of ticking time bombs are, are taking place with uh, diabetes and so on. If we can continuous, continuously monitor in those sorts of areas, we can get early insights into that and help shape uh, the behaviour. So that's one snapshot of where we are today. We have many, many more uh, that, that we're working on. Uh, we're really excited about this experiment uh, that, that we're running. Uh, I'm excited about it being so interdisciplinary. That will be hard, but I, I kind of like that challenge as well. Uh, we will need to work with all manner of people, not only within the team, but it's going to, it needs to be extremely collaborative, not only here in Canberra, not only in Australia, but also around the world. We're talking about the need for artificial intelligence knowledge, uh, digital health, human interface knowledge, psychology as well, human factors. And of course, I've been dodging some of the, the sharp stuff that we're, we're working on right now. Uh, so the dermatology, uh, the physical chemistry, the, ele the electrical engineering, all of those things. And, uh, and I'd like to just finish with something brief. Uh, I talked about 15 years. So earlier this year, uh, my Oxford mentor, the one that talked me into to going to Oxford, he, he died. And um, there was a reunion uh, for that. And um, we went back to Oxford, and that was, that was uh, a really touching uh, experience. But I looked around the room uh, at the people that I work with, uh, with that uh, Powderject uh, experience, and what they're doing now is amazing. Uh, it's, it's humbling. Uh, so the first PhD student that I had the privilege to, to supervise, he's now leading a company uh, there in Oxfordshire that's worth about a billion dollars and uh, producing tuberculosis tests that are being produced, uh, uh, distributed around the world. And that's just one example. Now, let's look ahead 15 years. Uh, so first for the record, uh, I don't want to be dead. Uh, but what does success look like uh, from running this experiment? Well, first, uh, we, of course, uh, would like to have an impact uh, with our devices uh, being out there and in use. Uh, one of the reasons why it needs to be a company as opposed to a not-for-profit is that actually to make an impact, you need to be a commercial. So that's the first. Uh, but the second is, uh, I'm really hopeful that the, the younger people, in particular, that come and work uh, with us and come through and get that kind of infection that I had over there in, in, in Oxford, uh, they're doing something like this 15 years down the line, whatever it is. I can't even predict what it is. And I really hope, I've got nothing against Oxfordshire, but, but um, <laughs> I really hope that a good slice of those will be doing that uh, here in Australia. And if we've done that through the innovation by doing and teaching, then I think we've done the job and we've got uh, a lot to be, be happy with. So on, on that note, I'd, I'd like to finish. Again, uh, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to, to see you. And, and I believe... Um, uh, in the spirit of conversation, you'll have the opportunity to ask uh, questions and put Brian and I uh, in the hot seat. So thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, so I'm going to lead a couple questions and then we'll open up to Q&A at the end. Um, so I guess one of the first things to think about is you're someone, uh, started in Australia, went overseas, did very well at Oxford, and you came back. So um, do you see that notion of brain drain being uh, a problem for Australia? And I guess what was the reason, ultimately, other than Peter Beattie, that you've decided to stay in Australia, uh, which is uh, not a common occurrence for uh, entrepreneurial people like yourself? Great question. <laughs> uh, so, I, people do talk about the brain drain uh, a lot, and um, it does happen, right? It's a, it's a real thing. Uh, but there's also a, a brain gain uh, from going abroad. Uh, and it cuts both ways as well. Uh, bringing people in, into here and having uh, multinational labs, I think it's a fantastic uh, thing. So, for me personally, I, I, I learn a lot uh, from that experience and was able to transplant some of those learnings back to here. And there's so many ways it opens up your thinking. I, I remember, as one example, um, when we were building Baxis and we were putting together the Series A investment, and uh, I drew up the budget, because I thought that's what you should do, and it was a $15 million budget. 
And the people around me, the, the TTO there, said, you can't do that. And I said, well, why not? And they said, that, that hasn't been done in Australia. And I said, well, we kind of did it in Oxford. Let's give it a go. Uh, so I think it's, it's good in opening up uh, your, your thinking. So play the long game uh, is probably my, my answer. Yes, some people will end up in, in England or wherever. Uh, but a whole bunch of people end up here too. And I think that's a good thing. And you found working in Australia compared to Oxford? I mean, how have you found it? What are the, what are the challenges you found working in Australia? And what are the opportunities you found working in Australia? Uh, I, look, I, I miss, on the challenges side, I, I miss the, the feeling of being close to everything. Yeah. yeah. And the reality of that too. Uh, if you needed to go across to a meeting somewhere in continental Europe, you can do that as a day trip. Uh, and things flowing through there so much. Uh, whilst here, um, it's kind of the, the destination people aren't passing through. Uh, so uh, I, I miss that. Um, but what, what I like about here uh, is um, well, I think we're developing our own Australian way of doing things. Uh, so yes, we're used to being resource constrained, but we kind of we kind of have an optimistic uh, approach of tackling things. And there is an upside to um, being left alone for a little while. So you, you can work things up, and then you can choose to put it out by your choosing. Uh, so, uh, but um, yes, the uh, and you know this better than anyone, Brian. The long the long distance flights are, are, are pretty tough. Yeah, you need a good skill set to be able to um, work on that. Absolutely. Yes, I caught up on <coughs> various uh, box sets yesterday coming back from San Francisco. <laughs> um, <coughs> um, so one of the experiments, excuse me, one of the experimental aspects of this really trying to embed a culture of entrepreneurialism. You said you got a, uh, you know, an apprenticeship for eight years. So how do you see that working here? Well, <coughs> so you can, you can study uh, innovation and you can read about it and you could maybe attend a, a course for a week and all of those things are useful. Uh, my observation though is nothing like doing it. Uh, so uh, the, our, our strategy here with Where Optimo is to have, have a kind of uh, an approach where all manner of people can, can flow in and be part of it. So say, say you're an academic here at ANU and you'd like a, a comment uh, for a taste of this. Uh, we, we want to allow that to, to happen. Although, we, of course, we can collaborate as well with you still uh, within uh, the university. That's fine. In terms of students as well coming through, uh, a PhD that uh, is... There's nothing wrong with a PhD. It's a great, it's a great thing, but of course I'm biased. I'm, I'm a product of that. Uh, but we all know that very few uh, PhDs will lead to a, a, the, the academic path. Okay, and if we can uh, provide an early taste uh, for PhD students where they get a, an industry uh, component by coming in and, and working with us, that can only help uh, in, in, that, in that space. Um, so I guess one of the things that uh, people in this room didn't really talk too much about it is there are a lot of people around the world working in the space. We know talked about Apple Watches yeah. in the beginning. We talked about Google. Uh, so what is your point of difference going to be? Why? I mean, so I'm going to take the classic Australian minister. We're not any good. We suck. Everyone's going to run us over. Why are we even bothering trying? Oh, I so, so answer that question. <laughs> Sorry right. to be a little negative. But yeah, well, uh, you know, to be clear, I've yet to meet a minister that said that to me directly. Uh, but <laughs> um, no, it's, you've got to know how to compete, okay? Uh, so my, my observation of this, this field of, uh, of wearable devices is, is as I mentioned, they're, they're toys. And people are doing the obvious things. Uh, they're putting a, a device on the skin and trying to hear stuff. Now, the skin's an amazing organ, uh, and it's a wall. A good way to look at it, it's a wall. It keeps the bad stuff out, the good stuff in. If you want to hear things, yeah, you can listen on the wall, and that's what Apple are doing, that's what others are doing. What do you hear? Well, you hear very few things, and the things you do hear, you don't hear very well. Okay? Now, um, it just turns out, I, I've been working for, for 20 years uh, with the skin, with functional medical devices, looking at the physiology of the skin. And we have the ability to gain access very shallowly into the skin for all manner of signals that you can't get on the surface. So uh, it's that unique knowledge base uh, that we're putting to work, uh, plus, plus the ability to, having done it before uh, once or twice, to actually put it together and make it happen uh, as, as well. So I think, I think that's, that's the summary. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, anything goes, uh, within reason. 
Uh, we'll start up there, sir, I, in the darkness. Please <laughs> ask your question. Uh, we're going to give you a microphone, if that's all right. Uh, we're recording this, so we want to make sure everyone uh, can hear the question. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation. Uh, just towards the end of your presentation, you said um, that to be successful, it's got to be commercial. And so my question is about that, because I'm just wondering who is going to benefit in terms of the recipients from all of this new technology in the health field? I would like to think that many people in the developing countries would be the main recipients. Uh, and there are examples, for example, Lixil that produced the bio toilet and is in the process of distributing 100 million at next to no cost to the, comp to the purchaser. Uh, would be the way to go with something like this, because we'd like to assess the health of everybody. Is there an equal chance for everyone in your agenda? <laughs> uh, so let's, let's start with the uh, commercial uh, comment, uh, and then I'll come on to the others. So uh, providing a little bit more context on that, what I'm talking about is providing a route towards impact. So if we didn't go commercial uh, and did fundamental research, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that, and I love fundamental research. But the question is, how does that work get taken forward to produce the functional devices that can actually be used by, by people in, in the setting for, for genuine uh, healthcare? And so where, where we're positioning uh, where Optimo is to, to help make that happen. And that doesn't preclude any of the, any of the things you talked about. Uh, so uh, I'm hugely passionate and always have been about the developing world uh, applications. It's one of the reasons why uh, I invented the Nano Patch was to meet that particular need. And uh, I'm keen to, to leapfrog the, the typical technology um, process, which is, so if you, if you use a, a car analogy, there's a, a technology that ends up, in, starts in Formula One, a supercar, Mercedes, and then eventually it'll end up in a day-to-day -day car. But that's a trickle-down uh, that, that tends to happen. I'm keen to try and leapfrog that the best way we can so we can get on the agenda um, the, the people in need uh, the most. So I suppose the short answer to, to your question is it's, it's all on the table. But presumably the commercial side is a way to raise the capital that allows you to actually create the technologies that can do that. And then that's right. how you license that, you could do that in a Nonprofit, presumably after that. So Correct. Lots of flexibility. Yep. Yeah. All right. Question up here. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, you, interestingly, you mentioned that you'd like to have a, a cross-disciplinary uh, team that brings in expertise from all around the university, and I gather your devices over time will produce a lot of uh, medical information in real time. Uh, governments have gone, spent billions of dollars on producing things like the summary care record in the UK and my health record in Australia. Will your, or does your technology plan to integrate with those type of efforts or will it supersede those uh, big uh, spending plans? And uh, therefore, do you need a political scientist as part of your interdisciplinary <laughs> team? Well, yes, please. <laughs> oh. Uh, that, 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 uh, that question has so many layers to it. Uh, our, our starting point is, is to generate the data. It's, it's to get in place the, the why bother. Uh, if we don't produce attributes that, with these, these particular uh, devices and technologies that make a difference in healthcare, then we don't even need to consider the kind of things that you've just talked about because we know that it won't, it won't be on the table. Uh, we certainly need to, to work closely with with, with people that have a light of sight uh, on that. We want to make sure that we... And a bad analogy, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. Um, we want to make sure that we don't end up with a format. Uh, so I'm probably showing my age, but I remember Betamax and, and VHS, right? So we want to make sure that we are plugging in the format that actually will, will work in, in that world. Uh, and it's, a, it's an interesting space. Who, who owns the data? How, how that works? We're fascinated in that, but our first job is, is to generate uh, the, the data that's, uh, that matters uh, in, in healthcare. Okay, good. 
Yeah, so um, the last time I took my kids to get a vaccination, which isn't as long ago as you might think, um, they didn't have a nana patch. So I'm just wondering um, two things. First of all, where is the nana patch at the moment? Like, what's its status in the world of vaccinations? And second of all, I have no idea. Like, it's a tiny little thing. How does it work? Where's the vaccine in that little <laughs> thing that you passed around? Where is it? Oh, there it is. <laughs> Uh, so that's just my sense of humour. Uh, so there's, there's one amount of patch used for, for clinical work. Uh, well, that one's not, uh, but uh, others are. Uh, so let's see. Uh, so this work has been published, so I can talk about it. Uh, so the nano patch uh, has been proven now clinically uh, using CSL's uh, vaccine. Well, it's, it's um, a subsidiary of uh, CSL called Securus. And um, I think I've got that correct. Uh, I'll just, just check. Yeah, okay, good. And uh, it's going forward in a company called, called Vaxis, and so there's further clinical work taking place. So it's not on the market. Yeah, I understand that. Uh, it comes back to, I was talking about the 15 year uh, thing. Uh, when I first came up with the core nano patch idea, it was uh, 2003. Uh, so here we are, it's 15 years later, it's not on the market yet, uh, but it's, it's got legs and it's, it's going forward. But it's not an easy ride. Where is the vaccine? Yeah. Uh, so uh, what, what we do is we, we dry coat the vaccine uh, so it's in solid format on the micro projections. Uh, it's typically about one micron thick. It's very, very thin film. Uh, and you manage to get, um, because of the way we concentrate the vaccine, you manage to get, if you wanted, a full human dose of, of the vaccine. Uh, but, and Brian touched on this briefly, um, but one of the attributes of, of the patch is it offers the possibility, uh, if, the, if the immunology allows us to do it, uh, for, for lower doses uh, than, than what you have with a, a standard needle-based vaccine. One of our uh, entrepreneurs here on staff, I see. Thank you, Vice-Chancellor. <laughs> um, you have a company, I believe, and I'd be interested to see how you see this company interacting with people developing intellectual property at the ANU, which may be in competition how do you foresee this uh, proceeding within the university structure? Oh, it's a good question. I mean, intellectual property is always one of those interfaces. How, how, do, you, how do you manage that? Uh, so we've, we've got a, a framework of a, a bunch of agreements uh, between uh, ANU and Amor Optimo that we've uh, worked up uh, really carefully, uh, try to, trying to capture the spirit of, of collaboration, trying to cut down. Um, we want to try and avoid uh, situations of people being partitioned uh, too much. So we're kind of leading towards a high trust uh, model because if we're, if we're, if I say it another way, um, I didn't really describe what a skunk works was by the way, but uh, uh, and uh, that, that's, the, the thesis of that is it's a, it's a tight team where uh, there's strong communication uh, between them and they're working well together. So. That's the spirit of what we're, we're looking to do. Uh, and recognise that, yeah, uh, I mean, it's a fine line between a, a competitor and a collaborator uh, anyway. And there's so, so many different fields, there's so many different ways where people can still do, do their thing, uh, yet different commercial interests can be looked after. So that's the spirit we're hitting it with. I think it's fair enough to say that it's a bit of an experiment and uh, we're gonna learn some lessons along the way. And I promise you that uh, if Wear Optimal takes off and is part of a <clears throat> mega company, the conversations will become more complicated. <laughs> but it's a complication I look forward to. <laughs> All right, so we're about, I'll take one last question if there is one, and then it's time. Over here, if that's okay. Yeah. Mark, you talked about problems with uh, the variability in healthcare of individuals. If you collect enough data, Will you get to the point where you can get an average profile that's significant, for example, so you could predict at the moment the population yeah. might get glu uh, glucose or diabetes, and what would happen, say, in 50 years if the CO2 concentration increased by X, which you can sort of predict? Can you tie a much better statistical uh, argument if you collect enough data, or is the, in is the variability so great in individuals that that yep. still doesn't happen? Uh, so developed a, a healthy respect for biological variability. Uh, 
what we're, we're looking to do with our, our devices is to, to measure it. So uh, in the absence of individual data points tracking uh, one person, what, what's the option? Well, the option is to do population-based approaches where you have to have many, many patients and take one, one data point and aggregate and do the kind of statistics, Alan, that, that you've um, uh, referred to. And that's, that's how traditional clinical trials uh, work. And you know that, that still will happen in, in many different formats. But what if, um, if you look at the asymptote at the other end where you've got a, a profile just for you? Uh, so you have a, a mountain of data generated just, just for you. So you will have your own biological variability, but you have your data. And then you've got it with many different sources that, that get aggregated. Then uh, a particular intervention can be tailored for you, uh, as opposed to just working off the average because there's always outliers. Certainly data in this field is always a good thing rather than a bad thing. There's going to be lots of complications uh, of how we do it. But again, that will be fun. I look forward Part to the data experiment. Yeah. All right, well, uh, I'm conscious to, well, it's time to wrap up. Um, but I'm going to have Nick Cardew Hall, uh, our acting deputy vice chancellor of research and innovation, uh, finish proceedings off. Uh, so it's uh, down to me to uh, do a vote of thanks. I first met Mark <clears throat> probably about two years ago um, when he first came to campus <clears throat> uh, on Brian's invitation and he took me through the concepts that you've heard today and I sat there and I felt not sure about this, a bit sceptical about this one. Um, and it wasn't that, that I don't think we could do it, I don't think it wasn't possible, but to do it you have to have the appropriate leader. Um, and, and, and I'm always you know, needing to test out the academic. Um, over that two year period, what I've observed with Mark is an outstanding academic in the traditional sense. What I've been more impressed over that time is that he is an inventor. He's an inventor in the spirit of Edison and, and Marconi. And I think that was a major you know, thing that sets him apart from his other academic colleagues. But over and above that, I've now observed him interface with politicians, senior bureaucrats, uh, major investors in, in London and California, uh, and a whole range of other stakeholders in a way that you can see that this is somebody that can really pull this together. And he was really deserving of being an ANU entrepreneurial professor. I think what we've seen today is a glimpse, I think, of what is something that's very exciting for us. And I think Mark has got the capability to lead us there. And I think we're very fortunate to have him here at the ANU. I think he's given us a glimpse in this lecture, and I'd just like us to give him a vote of thanks for giving us a view of what the future might be. Mark, thank you.